I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is Jeff Clark, Metals and Mining Analyst at thegoldadvisor.com. Thank you yeah. so much for joining me. Great to be back with you, Charlotte. Yeah, nice to see you again in person at BRIC. Yeah. Maybe we can start a little bit about talking about the sentiment on the show floor. You've been down there, you've been giving presentations, you've been talking to people. How's it looking? You know, I think attendance is up this year. Jay said at the, Jay Martin said at the dinner last night that they had 6,000 registrants. It's like, wow, that's a lot. Now, I don't know every single person showed up, but um, that's clearly above what it was last year. Uh, sentiment's a little bit better. Um, and you know what? It's feeling a little bit different too with gold and silver, with some of the sentiment of investors and that. So, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens this year. Uh, we could be on the cusp of something. We'll see. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if, if we see a little bit pullback in the price, but sediment does seem to be picking up here. So that's good. It is. It's good. I'm, I'm feeling pretty positive. The vibe seems quite good. So, but you know, we will see. We're at the beginning of a new year, and where I want to start today is by talking about your gold and silver outlooks that you put together. I really liked them because you lined up all of these different prices from various sources. So beginning with gold, I wondered if you could go through that range. It's a pretty big, big range from many different places. And then we'll talk about your thoughts on, on the gold. Right. So I still write uh, for Mike Maloney and goldsilver.com a little bit. And they really want those articles because they're very good to kind of bring attention to the market and all that. Um, I hate doing them because I don't want to go on record as saying this is what gold's going to do this year or whatever. So, uh, but they're popular. A lot of people like them. And the, there is value in making predictions because it, it makes you look at what other people are thinking. It maybe forces you to look at the reasons. Maybe you overlook something. It helps temper your expectations, good or bad. So I think there's a lot of value in them. But you're right. There was a big range there. I interviewed a lot of people to get it's there. Extensive, yeah. Yeah, it, and it was fun, you know, finding out what people were thinking and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, but the range is very big. Uh, most people in the industry do, I, I think, feel the same way that you and I feel that, you know, this is going to be a little bit better year. Gold was flat last year, you know, down the year before. So. Um, it feels like this could be a year where prices are rising uh, more for gold. Um, there were all kinds of reasons for that. A lot of people outlined in that article, um, but a big range. I think most people do see gold um, getting above 2000 this year, and that's not a big stretch from where we are right now, right? Um, but I think the, the, the bulk of the range was that $2,300, $2,500 you know, price level right in there. And that's where, where I put, you know, went on record and said where I think gold might go this year was similar in that range. Now, if we get some type of major, you know, crisis, um, it could spike higher than that. Yeah, all bets are off if something like that happens. So for you, you, you did all this research, you talked to a lot of people, you made your own prediction. For you, what are the major factors that you'll be watching when it comes to gold? Yeah, that's a good question because, uh, I mean, I think all eyes are on the Fed. And I, I hate, you know, relying on what the Fed's going to do to, you know, predict what, what gold might do. But it's really true. Um, you know, the tightening caused the dollar to soar, the U.S. dollar to soar. And that's what uh, led to gold's weakness. Gold was actually flat on the year last year, so it wasn't bad at all. Uh, just I think a lot of us obviously expected it to be higher. Uh, but what the Fed does if, if they ease, you know, the whole easing argument where they're not raising as much or they actually completely stop or they reverse course. And they could actually reverse course this year, believe it or not. The average time frame from the last rate hike to the first rate cut is only five months. That's it. That's the average. The longest was 13 months from the last rate hike to the first rate cut. But the average is five months. So if they raise another time or two, then they stop. We could potentially see them actually easing by the end of the year, <clears throat> which could happen if inflation comes down. That's another issue. Um, if we get a recession, if stocks remain weak and everybody's crying, my 401k is down, you know. So there's a lot of incentive for them to do that. They've been very stubborn about raising rates. I didn't think they would be this aggressive. Uh, and a lot of people didn't. 
but, but they have been. And so uh, I think there, that reversal, you know, going from a tightening to an easing cycle could easily be, you know, one uh, instigator of, of the lights of fire under gold. Yeah, I think definitely that'll be key in 2023 for gold. And when it comes to gold, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is gold versus the gold stocks, right? Uh -huh. And you shared some interesting numbers in your presentation here at BRIC yesterday. You're talking about the GDX and GDXJ and the percentages that they are still below compared to those yeah. 2011 highs. So yeah. I wondered if you could share that. I, I just wanted to look at what the price of all these ETFs and indexes and all that, what their price was in 2011 and compare it to now, because they're so oversold and sediment hasn't changed all that much yet. So I wanted to see, well, what's the opportunity that's there? So I looked at, I think, five or six of them in my presentation, and they were all dramatically, you know, I think the lowest... Uh, it would require a 126% rise for GDX to get back to the 2011 high. But the HUI, I think it was, uh, or the XAU, I forget which one now, would have to rise almost 400% to get back to its 2011 high. So now I'm not saying they're going to exactly match that level. I'm saying that shows you how undervalued they are now and what the kind of potential is that we're looking at. Because in 1980, all those indexes, if they existed, would have been much higher. And the other one I did was the, the Barron's Gold Mining Index and its ratio to the gold price. And Charlotte, I keep updating that darn chart at every conference I'm at, and it never changes. It's just, you know, the mining index is still dramatically undervalued compared to gold. It just hasn't moved all that much. Even though they've been up a little bit, you know, gold's up a little bit. So uh, it really highlights just how undervalued and oversold mining stocks as a group are. Yeah, you know, you did share, you shared so many statistics there. Honestly, I couldn't write quite fast <laughs> enough to keep up. But I think that really helps people situate themselves in where we are now, where the potential might be, even if we don't go to quite those levels. So for people who are looking, you know, maybe attending this conference, they're looking for gold stocks that they want to invest in. We know that you can't choose just any company. So where are you seeing opportunity? What types of companies or criteria are looking good right now? Well, anybody who knows me knows I like to eat a little further down the food chain with the explorers and developers and, and things like that. You know, my dad was a gold prospector, so I think it's in my blood to look at those kind of stocks. You know, um, I don't own a lot of producers or even watch a lot of them, you know, I, you know so uh, I'm going to look a little bit further down. Uh, now, that is riskier, you know, um, uh, but you, of course, can hit. Uh, greater potential or have greater potential and hit a bigger win with those. So you're kind of like Babe Ruth. You know, Babe Ruth hit a lot of home runs, but he also struck out a lot. So you have to make sure you own a basket if you're going to, you know, go down that route. But I like that because I like discovery. I like seeing how big a deposit might be, how rich it would be. Um, that's really where I'm at. So I'm, I'm looking there and you know, to evaluate those, as there can be a lot involved, but you always start with the three legs of the stool. Everybody says that you're people, property, and politics. So I want to know who's behind it and that they've been successful before with other companies. And all you got to do there is look up the stock performance of the last company they ran. That tells you what you need to know if they know how to create shareholder value. And then before I even look at the project, uh, if, I, if I've heard about a good drill result, I want to know where it is. If it's in some war-torn part of Africa, I don't really care too much about that drill result. And then, of course, then I look at the property. And, and you're there you're looking for big and rich, right? You're looking for something like my grandma's chocolate chip cookies, big and rich, right? So um, it's got to be big enough to matter to a major or show it has the potential to be big enough to matter uh, so that it can be taken over. Because most of these juniors are not going to develop these projects or put them into production, I should say. So it's got to be big or rich or both, you know, before I'm going to get really interested. But that's kind of the starting criteria, I think, for someone who wants to, to really look at, you know, uh, what kind of stocks you might be really prospective. And that's what I do at thegoldadvisor.com is, is I, I provide all of that. So. Okay, so yeah, we've got our three P's that we need to look at mm -hmm. for those ones. I want to ask though about, you know, who is getting money right now? Because you need money to move these projects forward. And, you know, we hear about inflation that's bringing up costs for yes. the mining companies as well. So who is getting funded? 
Uh, that's a great question because inflationary pre pressures are real in the mining sector just like everywhere else. So costs are going up and that includes development costs, putting something into production and even during the permitting process, what you have to do is gonna cost you more. Labor costs are going up, equipment costs are going up. So a lot of these uh, development projects, uh, the feasibility study that may have been done before, well now it's gonna cost a whole lot more. And that kind of put a damper on a, on a lot of companies because uh, it's costing more than what they thought it was gonna cost. So they, maybe they have to take out another loan or they have to issue more shares or something like that. So. Um, so it's a very real thing. So you have to be cognizant of that, but it's an even playing field. It's happening to most everyone, right? So, uh, so yeah, you have to be aware of that. But the companies that can raise right now, even if their price is down, that's a really important thing because you're right, it does take cash. They can only get income, revenue, whatever, uh, from debt, you know, taking out a loan, selling a royalty or issuing shares. And we don't like it when they issue shares, but they, they gotta have money somehow to advance their project. So you wanna make sure they're able to advance their project. That's really critical. And it's very interesting. You can line up all these companies and you can see companies that aren't able to raise cash and companies that can not just raise cash, but raise millions and millions of dollars. There's some small juniors out there in the, my portfolio on the website there that have done huge raises that's because fund managers, institutional investors are interested in those companies. They see the potential there. They're willing to write big checks. That's what you want to see. Yeah, and one more point on this before we move on. So we know that, so you mentioned that you want to see companies that will be a takeout target for a major miner. And we know that they need to be filling their pipelines at some point, probably in the near future. So are we seeing more from the majors in terms of let's go fund a junior, work with them from that point? Well, traditionally, a major doesn't really, um, uh, they, don't, they don't go out and prospect. They, when they're drilling, it, it's, it's brownfields. It, it's around their existing mines and that sort of, that's how they'll grow a deposit. And that's good, and they gotta do that. But they're not gonna go out and stake ground out in you know, upper BC to, to explore and see if there might be something there. No, they're gonna get most of their uh, feed, most of their new ounces are gonna come from buying out other companies, whether it be junior or developer or something like that. So the, the M&A uh, you know, cycles like prices do, right? But um, we're really on the cusp, I think, and a lot of people think that uh, we're on the cusp of a, another M&A cycle here. So um, the, you know, deposits and discoveries are going down they're getting lower grade. We're finding fewer big deposits. So it's really putting a crimp on majors and, and for a quality project out there, there are clearly gonna be some that are gonna be very attractive to majors. And so that's what you wanna look for. If it's attractive to a major or could be attractive to a major, that's the stock you might wanna look at. Okay, very interesting. I think now we can move on from gold. Let's look at silver. So okay. <laughs> you did your silver outlook as well for 2023. Again, looking at the big range of predictions from all kinds of different entities. Can you talk about the spread we saw there? And then, of course, yeah. your thoughts on silver. Yeah, so just just like silver moves more than gold, the spread on the silver predictions was bigger than, than it was for gold. They were all over the place. There were some bearish ones, but though most of the bearish ones were from mainstream banks and things like that. They're always bearish. I mean, they were bearish the whole way from 2001 to 2011. Every year, those, those guys, the banks, the big ones, said that silver was gonna go down. And it went up all the time. The first time they said that silver was gonna go up was in 2012. For 2013, what did silver do? It crashed big time. So I wouldn't put a lot of stock in them, you know? <laughs> Um, in fact, when they say that silver is going to, you know, rise a lot, then, then I might want to pay attention, <laughs> you know, that might be the top, but, but no, there was a big range. It was great to see. Uh, I think most of it, as you saw, most predictions were above $30 an ounce for this year. Um, some think it'll get to 35, 40. There were a few at 50. 
Um, so there was a, a little bit change in sediment this year, I think, for silver. A little people that are a little bit more strongly bullish or a little more confident, I should say, that silver was going to rise this year as opposed to, to not. Um, again, it was up three and a half percent last year. A lot of people don't realize that and it didn't feel like it, right? Because we thought silver was going to rise more, especially in light of inflation. But uh, so, yeah, I, 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 I'm in that camp that I think gold's going to be up or excuse me, silver is going to be up in the $30 range. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all. And what's interesting is, pardon me, if that materializes, uh, we're going to see uh, an exponential move in some of the miners, some of the more promising mining stocks. Not all of them, but some of those are going to do two, three, four times what the rise in silver does. Right. So we'll come back to that point. And before we go on to the miners, so let's talk a little bit about how these people might be developing their silver price forecast, because silver, of course, has its investment side and its industrial side. How do you weigh those two together when you're looking at it? Yeah, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, I thought silver would be higher last year than what it was, and I based it on inflation. Uh, it makes sense that silver would rise when in inflation spikes, right? And it didn't. And now inflation's coming down and silver started to rise. So it's doing the opposite of what not just me, but many people thought that it would do. Um, but 54, 55 percent of all silver uh, supply or demand goes toward industrial uses. Uh, and that's slowly creeping up over time. It's becoming more of a almost a base metal or industrial metal as opposed to an investment metal. But industrial metal, you know, slowly creeping up, but it doesn't fluctuate a whole lot. Silverware demand, photography use, um, uh, jewelry, uh, religious objects, all these things, they don't really fluctuate all that much. The one variable that fluctuates the most and therefore drives the price the most is investment demand. Investment demand for physical was up last year, but for ETF demand where the big boys play, where the institutional and fund managers are at, that was actually down. It was below average last year. So if you see it, both of those groups of investors begin to buy and, and demand is higher from them this year, silver's going up. We know that. Historically, that, that's what we see for the past 50 plus years. When investment demand from both sources is high, the silver price goes up. So I think there's a good chance that we see that this year. And, and if we do, if we see institutional fund managers come in, and there's some evidence of that already, um, I think silver is going to rise this year, and perhaps substantially, we'll see. Okay, yeah, actually that helps me understand on, on the investment side, both of those sources demand is, is what we need to see. Mm -hmm. So one more comment on the industrial side of silver, yeah. because you mentioned that it's looking more like a base metal even, and I know that people are maybe a little concerned about the base metals because of recession worries, things like that. So what happens to silver in that case, especially because it's also produced, as we know, as a byproduct from some of those base metals? So silver is a hybrid metal. It has the industrial use and it also has the monetary use. Industrial use is growing, but the monetary use is still there and it's very real. Good example was 2009 to 2011. Look what the silver price did during the great financial crisis. When industrial demand for all kinds of metals, including silver, was going down, the price was spiking big time. Um, so you do have to look at investment demand, even though industrial demand may be waning or, or weak at, at any given time. So, um, and I'm sorry, what was your question? I, I blanked oh, on where I'm silver, going. Oh, the question silver in a recession because of its industrial uses, if we see those decline. Yeah, yeah. so silver does actually not perform well during the official period of a recession. Uh, it, gold does well. Uh, it usually rises during a recession. Uh, silver tends to be flat or down during the official period of a recession. So before and after the recession, you know, it, it's really different uh, or can be different. So, uh, you know, a slowdown in the economy will affect industrial demand. But again, it comes down to the reason uh, why we have the recession. If it's strictly economic and there's nothing else going on, silver may not do as well. But if there's anything monetary going on with, with the Fed or QE or debt or other things like that that are more, you know, concerning to people, 
uh, they'll rush into gold and then they'll rush into silver. This has been demonstrated many times throughout history. And silver, as we also know from history, outperforms gold before that run is over. So the average spike, I'll throw this out at you, the average spike in the silver price. I, I went back and looked at every spike on a chart for silver going all the way back to the 1970s. And I looked at all of them, I averaged them, and the average spike in silver is 150.4%. So it shows you that when investors get excited about silver, regardless of what the reason may be, that the silver price can really go in a run, and the average is a double and a half just in silver. Okay, so silver, it's a tricky metal. Thanks for helping yeah. us unravel it a little bit. As we're getting to the end here, we have to talk about your announcement that you made here yesterday. <laughs> you have a book coming out. So tell us a little bit about that, what it's about, where we can find it. Yeah, uh, I'm really proud to say it took two years. It was a lot of work. Um, and I interviewed a lot of people in the book. It includes my strategy. Um, anyway, it's called Pay Dirt. You know, mining for profits with gold and silver stocks. How to hit pay dirt in your portfolio. Um, but it's very detailed, very specific. There are 16 outside experts I included in it. So it goes into a lot of detail. And uh, it's, it's very uh, clear on what you should do. It tells you exactly what to do because it's what I do. Uh, it's what I've been doing. And, you know, do this, look for that. Don't look for that. If you see that, that's a no. If you see this, you might be onto something. So... Uh, it's very clear. It's very specific. Um, and the experts I interviewed in the book were all the same way. They weren't general. They weren't vague. They weren't like, oh, you might look at this. No, they were very clear. They were very opinionated about what they think you need to look for in a mining stock as a good sign that it might be a good one. There, there's hundreds of quotes from these guys in there, including some of their big wins. They even put some of that in there. there there's some pretty big wins in there that they've had in their career, so they're worth listening to. So uh, we're in pre-sale right now. But it publishes this Friday, February 3rd. So it um, uh, comes out there, and it's at thegoldadvisor.com. You'll see a tab at the top for a pay dirt book. Um, but it's, it's all there. And you can even read a sample chapter, which was kind of fun because it's the most terrifying mine I ever entered. And it talks about that. So if you're claustrophobic, be warned that it might be a little nerve wracking. And then from there, it goes into an emergency phone call from the hospital about the most important person in the world, your mother. And what does that have to do with gold and silver? Everything, you'll see. So it's kind of fun, but you can read some of those things uh, on the website now before the book comes out. It, yeah, I did. I did go check out the chapter yesterday that you posted it. Yeah, definitely. If you're claustrophobic, stay away. <laughs> but it was very engaging. So looking forward to the full book on February 3rd. Thank you for joining me today to go over everything happening in gold and silver. Oh, great. Thank you, Charlotte, for having me. Let's do it again. Of course. OK. And once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network. And this is Jeff Clark with thegoldadvisor.com.